Bible study has always been my favorite service. Amen. So I'm glad you've come tonight. <clears throat> Praise God. we got people that are working night shift and evening shift and all of this stuff. But uh, I'm glad you're taking time out of your busy schedule to come to study the Word of God. Now, the last several, well, I guess I could say probably toward the end of December and uh, uh, probably all of January, I've been teaching and preaching along a certain line. I've been teaching and preaching on the theme or along the line of moving forward, kind of forgetting yesterday's, grabbing on to a glorious tomorrow. I said back a couple of weeks ago on the beers repeating that most of my preaching and teaching in 40 years has actually been seemingly along that line to try to get people to lay down that which was and grab a hold of which is tomorrow. Forget in the past, the hurt, the wound, the bruise, and the so on and so forth. Moving on to into what God has for them. And uh, so we've been teaching along that line and preaching along that line pretty well all the month of January. And we're going to go a little deeper tonight and a little farther along that line. We're going to go into the future. We're going to go and try to hold on to or grab a hold on to or move into the promises of God. That being said, I want you to turn tonight to 2 Kings chapter 7, all right? 2 Kings chapter number 7, and uh, if you're a note taker, please write down these scriptures and study them out. I appreciate it if you would the next week or so, in your spare time, if you just take the scriptures that I give to you and just study them out, because I, I give a lot of scriptures when I'm teaching. Uh, I try to, to exhort the Word of God, not just little poems and fairy tales and stories, but Amen, the word of God. All right, 2 Kings chapter 7. We read the first eight verses, and then we'll read verse number 19, and then we'll teach. Okay, Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, and verse number 19. <clears throat> 2 Kings 7 and 1. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time, Shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria? The prophet says about 40 pounds will be sold tomorrow for about 65 cents. That's a pretty good deal. 40 pounds of flour and barley for 65 cents. That's a pretty good deal. <laughs> then a lord of whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. Now this is important. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we shall enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we will die also. If we stay here, we're going to die. And if we go into the city, we may die. So here's what they say. Now therefore, come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made a host of the Syrians to hear noise of the chariots, the noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the king of the Hittites and the king of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight, left their tents and their horses and their donkeys, even as the camels was and fled to, for their life. Then notice verse 8. And when these lepers, or these four lepers, came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink, carried that silver and gold and raiment, and went and hid it, and came again and entered into the tent and carried that also, and went and hid it. Verse number 19 of the same chapter, excuse me, of the same chapter, 2 Kings 7, 19. And that Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might such a thing be. And he said, Behold, thou shalt see with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. Tonight, and if the Lord tarries, and the Greek don't rise, maybe in the next Bible study we'll continue on in this. I want to talk to us, teach us a couple of weeks on a thought that is called, They had, we have nothing to lose. 
They had nothing to lose. We have nothing to lose. This is a powerful, powerful, powerful chapter in the book of Kings. But to really understand what's being said here in chapter 7, we have to drop back to chapter 6 and get the foundation of what's being said. 2 Kings 6, 24 through 29. All right, 2 Kings 6, 24 through 29. We will set the foundation or we will tell you what's about to happen in chapter 7. In 2 Kings chapter 6, 24 through 29, this passage actually is in a twofold setting. 2 Kings chapter 6, 24 to 29 is two faceted. Number one, it's the condition of Samaria. And it's also the condition of the people's minds that were in Samaria. All right? The Bible says that Samaria was besieged. The city was besieged. But also their minds was besieged. All right? Samaria is besieged naturally. But speaking spiritually, the church sometimes have what I refer to as a besieged mentality. Now we're going to look at 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 24 to 29. And here's what happens. Number one, the people of Samaria have their city besieged. And they also have what I call a besieged mentality. And I'll explain that. 2 Kings chapter 6, 25 says that there was a great famine in Samaria. Now when we're in chapter 7, it's referring back to this famine that is spoke of in chapter 6. So there was a famine in Samaria. Actually, the Mahanadad, the king of Syria, comes up and besieges the city. Now notice what happens. A donkey's head was sold for four score pieces of silver, and a fourth part of dove's dung was sold for five pieces of silver. Now, I'm not a farmer. Tim has a little hobby farm there. He's got some good food that comes out of that place. They gave me lamb chops for my birthday. Mercy. Only thing wrong, there was only two. 200 would have been better, but that's okay. Thank you for the two. 20 would have been better, but they're very good. I don't have a clue about farming. I really don't. I'm actually scared of animals. I, I don't like animals at all. They might bite me, and, and so on and so forth. Probably won't, but that's maybe my, in my own head. But I would say my grandfather was a farmer, my dad had a garden and I have a can opener. That's all I know about farming, all right? I don't have a clue about it. But I do study some of this stuff out. I, do, I really do because I, I don't have a clue about farming. But they tell me that a donkey's head is the worst of all foods to eat. That's what Mr. Google says anyway. I don't know if he knows what he's talking about, but Mr. Google says that a donkey's head is the worst food to eat. Mr. Google says it is the most toughest food to eat. Now, I've never tried it. I have no intentions on trying it, all right? Just say it. I have no intentions on trying donkey's head. My wife was born and raised way up north, and they tried all kinds of different food. They ate squirrel and beaver and, 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 and I started to say skunk, but not skunk. <laughs> they, they ate moose and deer and caribou and bear and all that kind of stuff. Seal. And seal and whatever. But I, 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 I'm not going to try this donkey's head. They say it's very tough and they say it's uh, the worst food you can eat. But I do know that a donkey is a very stubborn animal. Mr. Google says that a donkey is the most stubborn of all animals. So if you eat donkey's head, you're just going to get more stubborn. And I've been, <laughs> I've been pastoring and preaching 40 years. You guys celebrated it here Friday night, 40 years. I pastored some stubborn people in my life. I'm telling you, they, were, they had a daily diet of donkey shit. There's no doubt in my mind. They didn't have bacon and eggs for breakfast. They had donkey shit because they were very, very stubborn. Oh, but nonetheless, donkey shit will make you more stubborn. Now, they sold donkey shit for uh, so much pieces of silver. And they sold dove's dung. Once again, the dove's dung is not the dove. It's only where the dove has been. It's only the dove's remains. A lot of churches, and I don't want to get too critical tonight, but a lot of churches, they only talk about the dove's dung. Dove is a type of the Holy Ghost. If you read the dove in the scripture, it's a type of the presence of God. Genesis chapter 8, remember? Noah sent out a dove. Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus was baptized, the Bible says the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. So dove in the scripture is a type of the spirit of the presence of God. They were eating dove's dung. They were just eating the remains. Once again, a lot of churches, 
They don't talk about the dove. They only talk about what the dove used to do and where the dove has been. We don't want that, right? We want to move of the spirit. We want the dove, all right? So they're eating dove's dung and donkey's head. And uh, they are besieged. The city is besieged. And their mentality is besieged. Their mentality has to be besieged. Because how in the world would you eat dove's dung and donkey's head and think it was okay? Now watch what happens in verse number 26. And as the king of Israel is passing him on the wall, the crowd of women saying, Lord, help us. Verse 27 is important. He says, if the Lord do not help thee, I can't help thee out of the barn floor or the wine press. When you read the barn floor in the scripture, it is a type of wheat. And wheat in the scripture is a type of the word. I'll prove that point. The Bible says, and write this verse down, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. 1 Corinthians 10 and 6. 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. The Apostle Paul writes to the church and says, These things, or the Old Testament Scripture, happen for examples to us. The word example in that Scripture means illustrations. They were illustrations for us. Naturally speaking, in the church, spiritually speaking. Verse 11 says, They happen unto us for examples or patterns. So church, when you study, and I have always been a student of the Old Testament. I don't know why I just get caught up in the Old Testament scriptures. I start studying names and I start studying places and I start, start because it's 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 types, it's shadows and types of what's going to come. The New Testament says the law or the Old Testament was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. All right? So these things, when you read these stories, it's not just stories. It's not that the writer of Kings or the writer of Chronicles or the Samuels had nothing else to say or to write. They just say, okay, let's just write this. They write these things, and the things happen unto Israel in the Old Testament are spiritual types and shadows unto the new. So he says, I can't help you from the barn floor. In other words, there's no wheat. There's no word. Then he said, I can't help you from the wine press. Wine speak, you know, the wine press speaks of wine, and wine in the scripture speaks of his presence. So he said, I can't help you. I can't help you from the wine press. I can't help you from the wheat or the barn floor. I'm here tonight to tell us, and this is going to get powerful, I promise you. When there's no fresh wheat, yes. no fresh word, when there's no fresh wine, no fresh spirit, People will do the strangest things in the church world. When there's no fresh word, oh church tonight, when there's no fresh presence of God, when there's no fresh praise unto God, the church world does the strangest things that you've ever heard in your life. Let me prove it. Verse number 28. And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give me thy son. And we may eat him tomorrow, and we'll eat your son the next day. Well, how crazy can these people get? I mean, not only is the city of Samaria besieged, their mind is besieged. Not only is the city in captivity, their mind's in captivity. He can't help them because there's no fresh wheat. He can't help them because there's no fresh wine. And they start boiling their children and eat them. In other words, they boil or destroy the next generation. Praise God. Hear me what I said. They can't, there's no wheat. There's no wine. They're starving. The city's besieged. Their mind is besieged. They're eating dove's tongue and donkey's head. And now they start destroying the next generation. Isn't that church really in typology and shadows and types? Isn't that a true picture of the church? When the church doesn't have a fresh word from God, when the church doesn't have fresh presence from God, they destroy the next generation. Let me give you kind of what I mean. I was pastoring back east several years ago. We were in a tremendous move of God. We were in an absolute move of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was poured out. And and, and after I left there, the church started going down. And I pray that I didn't build that church on my personality. You understand what I'm saying? I don't want the church to be built on me because I may die tomorrow. And everybody will have a big hallelujah service and Tell a big bunch of lies about how good a man I was. <laughs> but after I left, the church started going down. And the church became very carnal. And every one of those single, of those precious young people that we had in that church, 
They backslid. <clears throat> they left the church. You know why? There was no fresh word. And I'm not taking credit. I don't want anybody to read me wrong. There was no fresh word in the house. There was no fresh presence in the house. There was no exuberant fresh praise in the house. And they started killing the next generation spiritually. You understand what's happening here in 2 Kings chapter 6? So here's what happens. He said, I can't help you. I want to say this again. When there's no fresh wine or fresh word in the house, people will do strange things. Turn with me to the book of Ruth, all right? Joshua judges Ruth. Turn with me to Ruth chapter 1, the first five verses. Write down the scripture. I'm going to prove some things tonight, church, of where the church world is right now and where we need to be as a church of Jesus Christ. I already said, when there's no wheat and word in the house, wine and spirit, people will do strange things. So what's happening in the book of Ruth is this. The scripture says there was a famine, verse 1 of Ruth chapter 1. Bible says there was a famine in Bethlehem, Judah. Yes. Bethlehem means the house of bread. Yes. Judah means praise. So there's a famine in the house of praise and in the house of bread. There's no fresh bread and there's no fresh praise. Bethlehem, Judah, house of bread, house of praise. There's no fresh bread. There's no fresh praise. There's a famine for bread. There's a famine for praise in Bethlehem, Judah. What happens? The scripture says the man there by the name of Emelech, <clears throat> he takes his wife Naomi, two sons Malon and Chelion, and they go down to Moab. They leave the house of bread. Church, they leave the house of praise and they go down to Moab. They should have never been in Moab because Moab is not a godly place. Moab is the first son that was born to Lot and his eldest daughter. Remember when Lot and his daughters come out of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember how Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt? Lot's first daughter went in under center, uh, excuse me, father drunk. And the first boy that was born to Lot and his eldest daughter, they called him Moab. From Moab, we get the Moabites. They're not a spiritual people, right? They were born out of sin and filth and debauchery. Understand what I said? So what happens is Emelech, Malon, and Chelion, Naomi, they go down to Moab. And they stay there for 10 years. And while they are there, <clears throat> Emelech dies. Malon and Chelion die. You know the story. And Naomi heads back home and Ruth comes with her. What happened in this story is very simple. Because of a famine in Bethlehem, Judah, because of a famine in the house of bread and the house of praise, they go down to Moab. No word, no praise, they leave. There's a famine in the house of God. There was a famine in the house of God. And because of that, they go down to Bethlehem, excuse me, down to Moab. Famines in the scripture, naturally, is also a type of things spiritually. Write this portion of the scripture down, Genesis 12 and 10. I'm going to get back now to Kings in a moment. Write this down, Genesis 12 and 10. The Bible says there's a famine in Abram's life, and he took his wife, Sarah, down to Egypt because there was a famine. He leaves, they go down to Egypt because of a famine. And down there, he almost loses his wife because she was fair to look upon. And the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, come and took her. And Abram said, when you get there, don't tell them that you're my wife. Tell them that you're my sister. That was only half true. Because of a famine, Abram ends up down in Egypt. Write this down, Genesis 41 to 45. Genesis chapter 41 to 45. It's the story of Joseph in the famine that came in all the land. And they stayed down in Egypt for 430 years. All right? So famines cause people to do strange things. So now we come back to 2 Kings. Aren't you glad we're back there? 20 days, we're back to Kings chapter 6 and chapter 7. So I told you the story about chapter 6. What happened is this. There's a natural and a spiritual condition. Right? <clears throat> Hallelujah. Samaria is besieged. Naturally and spiritually. No wheat, no wine. They're boiling their own children, killing the next generation. So now we come to my text in chapter 7. This is what happened we find four leprous men. We pick up the story in chapter 1. 
the prophet says, in the midst of this famine, 2 Kings 7 and 1, the prophet Elijah says, tomorrow there's going to be food for everybody. He said, tomorrow 40 pounds of food will be sold for 65 cents. The previous chapter, they're selling, they're selling donkeys in for 80 pieces of silver. That's pretty expensive, you know that? Because Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver, and Jesus himself was sold for 30 pieces of silver. They're selling donkeys in for 80 pieces of silver. And the prophet steps up, stands out in time, and says, tomorrow, 40 pounds of food will be sold for 65 cents. Tomorrow, he says, there's going to be food for everybody. Tomorrow, the word of the prophet, there's going to be food for everybody. And everybody doesn't believe him. They say, oh, come on now. Yeah. And then in verse 3 and 4, it says this. There were four leprous men sitting there. And these four leprous men, they get this crazy idea, church. They get this wild revelation. I, I want to say it like this. Listening to their reasoning. Let's take a listen or, to this revelation they have. And I want to God tonight that we could get the revelation or the reasoning of these four leprous men. These four leprous men say, listen, if we stay here outside of the gate of Samaria, we're going to die. We're going to starve to death anyway. There's no food out here and we're going to die. But the prophet said inside the gate of Samaria tomorrow, there's food for everybody. And if we go inside the gate, the Syrians may kill us and we'll die. So here's the deal. If we stay out here, we're going to die. And if we go inside, we may die. So in actuality, they say, the Bible says, they said to one another, and I paraphrase, we ain't got nothing to lose. If we stay out here, we're going to die. I mean, that's, that's the deal. There's no food out here. There's no wheat. There's no wine. We're going to die outside the gate. And if we rise and break down the gate and go inside the city of Samaria... Maybe, perhaps, perchance, per adventure, the Syrians will kill us and we'll just die. So we got nothing to lose. So I kind of paraphrase and tell you, they said, let's give it a shot. I mean, we got nothing to lose. Die here, die in there, what's the difference? Sit here, die, run inside and die. So let's give it a shot. Let's, let's take a chance. Let us just chance, perhaps, the prophet is speaking a word from God. Maybe there will be food for everybody tomorrow. So here's what happens. In the face of the famine, in the face of the besieged mentality in Samaria, they had absolutely nothing to lose. And I think what happened to these four lepers men church is this. They grew tired of donkey's head and dove's dung and boiled children. Every revival that I've ever been a part of or read about started with a discontent. Every revival that I've ever been a part of started in a frustration. And I tell people all the time, I was born hyper, I'll die hyper. <laughs> I was born impatient, and I'll probably die impatient. I say all the time when it comes to a move of God, I was born frustrated, and I'll probably die frustrated. I believe these four lepers men got tired of no wheat, no wine, no fresh word, no fresh presence, no fresh praise, I think they got tired of donkey's head and dove's dung and boiled children. and said, you know what? If we continue, we're going to die. If we continue on this path, if we just continue to sit here, we're going to die. And if we go inside the city, we may die also. So we got really nothing to lose. Uh, we're, we're tired of the dove's dung. Have you ever in the church ever grown tired of dove's dung? You know what that means? Don't you ever get tired of people only talking about the move of God that used to be. That's dove's dove. That's where the dove has been, and that's what the dove used to be. You get somebody to testify. And we used to have the old testimony services that used to get me depressed. Because half the testimony service is about somebody dying, or somebody broke their back or something. Or something. They never had much praise testimonies. But, but, but it was kind of negative all the time, so I kind of got away with those things. But anyway... Uh, because I grew tired of people only talking about what used to be. Yes. They'd get up and say, you know, I remember the good old days. So do I. I'm a third generation Pentecostal. Frankie and my grandmother Hazel 
came to the Lord way, way, way back. My grandfather, Ron McDonald, and his wife Pearl came to the Lord on January the 1st, 1942. My grandfather, Ron McDonald, was baptized through the hole of the ice in the Miramichi on January the 1st, 1942. They tell me it was one of the coldest January days ever came. They cut a hole in the ice with a saw, and they wired pulp hooks. You know what a pulp hook is? It's a hook to lift wood with on the end of a ladder. And C.B. Dudley allowed, uh, lowered my, my grandfather, Ron McDonald, and Pearl down into the Miramichi River, January the 1st, 1942. But I used to grow tired of only thing people testified about was how God used to move, and how God used to move, and what he used to do, and how he used to heal. I grew tired many years ago of the dumb dumb. Excuse my expression. You understand what I'm trying to say? I grew tired of the testimonies of only what used to be. And these four lepers men said, I'm tired of the dumb dumb. I'm tired of donkey's head. I'm tired of boiling children. We got nothing to lose. We got absolutely zero to lose. Let us arise and go into the city. That's a revelation that I would to God that the church could get today. If we said, here we die. But if we go inside the city, we may die. But hey, maybe perhaps the word of the prophet is true. Hallelujah. That's where the church is at today. I would to God in Jesus' name that we would get that revelation that we got nothing to lose. I can die here with a besieged mentality or I can die trying to have a move of God. That's, that's a pretty good alternative, actually. I can die with a besieged mentality or, hallelujah, I can die trying to have a move of God. When I was young, <clears throat> in energy more than I have now. Can you imagine me pastoring you when I was 20 years old? Oh, my God. Fast and furious. They say there's an old movie called The Fast and the Furious. That was me. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. We're tired. I don't care. Let's go. Let's have church six weeks in a row. I'm too tired. I don't care. You're tired. Let's have church. On and on and on. Remember I told you the stories. I was pastoring in Hartland. And uh, I, I told you this before, but it bears repeating in this message tonight. I used to try to get them to stand and worship. Remember I told you that story. I go to the pulpit and say, let's all stand. They just sit there. And I felt like saying, what part of let's all stand? Who do you guys understand? You know, like, really? They just sat there. So on a Sunday morning service, <clears throat> after the service, I called Robert Grant. I said, Robert, I need you to come to the church. What for? I said, get over here. Over we come. I said, the people in this church tonight, they're going to stand. <laughs> How do you know? I said, I know they are. They're going to stand. How do you know? I said, oh, they're going to stand tonight. I want you to take all the pews, get yourself a buddy. I want you to take all the pews and pile them up, pile them up against the building outside. So when you pulled into the church in Harlan, you couldn't see around the other side. So they came into church that night. You know, everybody saunders in half asleep like we used to do on a Sunday night. And uh, there's no pews in the house. Guess what? They stood that night. I didn't say they were spiritual. I didn't say they worshipped. Come on. I didn't say they were in a good mood. I'm just saying in that service that night, they stood. But I used to, they used to say this testimony about me. They said, he'll probably do something for God if he doesn't break his neck first. Because it was fast and furious. What I'm trying to say tonight, church, in the Holy Ghost, in this teaching, we can stay right here in our experience and die. Yeah, we can. Or we can be like the four lepers men and say, you know what, if we go forward, we could probably die also. But we got really nothing to lose. So the four lepers men took a chance on it. Hear what I said. The four lepers men, they took a chance on the word of the prophet. And they went inside the city, and when they got in there, according to verse 8, and I'll read it again, 2 Kings 7 and 8, And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink. Woo, hallelujah. Yeah, they're starving to death yesterday outside the camp. They went into one tent and ate and drank, and they carried them silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it, and came again and entered into another tent and carried tents also and went and hid it. Why, church? Because inside the gate, according to the word of the prophet, there's food for everybody. But they had to take a chance. Yeah. They had to go for it. They could not be satisfied here. And I preached my whole life. We cannot be satisfied in the place right now. Amen. If it's this high, this high, that high, if it's ankles, knees, loins, or waters to swim in, 
You cannot be satisfied. We cannot be satisfied in the place that we're at right now because there is more for us. You have to believe it, church. You have to get this understanding. You have to get this revelation. We're, we don't have it all just yet. We have just as... I don't think we say a drop in the bucket. Remember in the old Pentecostal church, we used to say it's just a drop in the bucket. I don't even know if it's a drop in the bucket compared to what God has for the church in the last of the last days. You remember on Sunday, I was preaching about how David pursued and overtook and overcame and, and uh, recovered all. Remember that story? I have to ask you the question. Let's be like those four lepers men and say, why are we going to sit here till we die? I'm not satisfied with death. How about you? I'm not satisfied with spiritual death. And I've seen this my whole life, church. I'll hurry to a close in this lesson in the next 10 minutes. I've seen this my whole life. I've seen it my whole life. People set right in the midst of a move of God and die never going on to the gate of the city. Setting right in the midst of a move of God. Praise God. And the preacher would get up and say, or the prophet would get up and prophesy, and say, God has so much more for you. I'd like to have one dollar every time I've said that in the last 40 years. What a cruise I would have. Hallelujah. What excursions I would go on <laughs> if I had one dollar for every time that I've ever said in the pulpit that God has more for the people of God. Yeah. Amen. Um, did I say that a million times? At least. At least a hundred thousand times I've said in my ministry, God has so much more for us. Yes, Hallelujah. I've said a hundred thousand times, don't be satisfied outside of the gate. Yes, don't right. be satisfied as it were in the place that you are right now. Yes. That God has so much more for the people of God. The four lepers men said, we're, we're going to die. Or we're going to die. Who cares then? What have we got to lose? We said, here we die. And if we go after the things of God, we may die also. But I'm a type person. If I'm going to die, let us go after that which God really has for us. Because I have to say this tonight, church. I just wonder what God has in store for those that say, I've got nothing to lose. I'm not going to sit in this place until I die spiritually. Praise God. Let me, let me explain this. I'd like to know how many times in my ministry, and I said it last week, I think it was, or maybe it was Sunday morning, that I looked in the spiritual mirror and I began to take inventory. Mm-hmm. And I began to say, you know what, Perry? You're dying in this spot right here. Mm-hmm. Your ministry is, is, is stifle a word. Archie Bunker used to say that to Edith all the time. Stifle yourself. Not only is stifle a word. Is, you know, is it? I don't even know if it is. But it is now. Okay. It is. I, I, you know, you're stifled in this place. You're, you're, you're stagnant in this place where you're at right now. You are, you're, 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 you're stale in this place that you're at right now. Perry, you need to stir yourself up a little bit. You, you need to stir yourself up. And you need, to, you need to look into the mirror spiritually, Barry. You need to look into my word spiritually. And then you need to, you need to go to deeper prayer. And you need to go to different, 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 excuse me, deeper worship and deeper praise. And you need to stir yourself up. Because, Perry, I've got so much more for you than what you have right now. Perry, you're sitting outside the gate and you're dying. All you need to do is take a chance. And the Lord would say, Perry, all you have to do is believe my word. I've got so much more for you. And I only received a deeper walk with God. And church, I only received a deeper anointing from God when I stirred myself up and said, you know what? I'm frustrated, but my frustration is, is pushing me into the presence of God. And these four lepers men said, you know what? We've got nothing to lose, and I'll hurry to a close with this. I want you to turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 13 and the book of Luke chapter 19. Praise God. Well, I've said a lot in the last 35 minutes. See, it doesn't take me long, you understand? So when you hear these long-winded preachers, tell me. See, our preacher says a lot in a half an hour. Just go fast, right? Don't take rabbit trails. Just go fast. But I want you to move to New Testament now because I gave you some Old Testament stories. But I want you to go to Luke chapter 13. And I want us to read verse 34. Luke 13, 34. This is Jesus Christ speaking. 
Luke 13, 34. Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets, and stonest thou that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Luke chapter 19, verse number 41. Okay, Luke 19, 41. I want you to uh, write it down, and also we're going to read it. Praise God. Praise God. Luke chapter 19 and 41. Watch this. This is Jesus speaking again. And then, excuse me, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. This is Jerusalem. It's the same city that he called out 34 of Luke 13. We just read. Remember Luke 13, 34? He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. 41 of Luke 19. And when he was come near, he beheld the city or Jerusalem, and he wept over it. Why? And says, If thou hast known even thou, at least in thy days, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they're hid from your eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round about, and keep thee on every side. And they shall lay thee even within the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave a stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. He says, listen, if you knew, if you only knew the things that rightfully belong to you. He said, if you only knew that this was the time of your visitation. Woo! Oh God, tonight. He says, if you, if you only knew that this is the hour of your visitation. Church, could we grasp that tonight? Oh, hallelujah. That this could be the greatest hour. And I believe it is. That this could be the, as it were, the greatest hour. Oh, hallelujah. The greatest hour that the church has ever been privileged to live in. Maybe we can boast about the 1940s, and we need to. And maybe we rejoice because there was a revival in the 40s and 50s. You can read it in the history of Canada. There was a revival in the 40s in Canada. But in the late 70s and early 80s, there was what referred to as the silent revival in Canada. Not much was written about it, and not much was talked about, but there was a move of God in the, in the early 80s. But maybe those things are just a precursor to what God would like to do in the last of the last days. Maybe this is the hour of your visitation. Maybe, church, this is the hour for your children. Oh, God, tonight. Maybe this is the hour for your spouse. Maybe this is the hour for your loved ones. Maybe this is the hour of visitation for your spouse, your children, your friends, your neighbors, the so on and so forth of life. He said, if you knew that it is the hour of your visitation, I believe it is. I believe that I, I, I know this. I am so tired of dove's dung. <laughs> I'm so tired of donkey's head. Aren't you tired of stubborn people? Come on, come on. Aren't, aren't you, God of heaven, aren't you tired? Yep. I get so tired of pushing people, pushing people. Yes. I remember <clears throat> Brother Kilgore. Anybody remember old James Kilgore? He preached my ordination in 1989 at the church in Toronto. Brother Kilgore told the story. Him and his wife was driving down the road on a Sunday afternoon. And he stopped the car and he jumped out of the car and started dancing in circles. And his wife said, James, what has happened? Have you lost your mind? He said, did you see that train going? She said, yeah, i seen that train. He said, I got so excited when I saw something moving that I wasn't pushing. <laughs> he said, the train's moving and I'm not pushing it. I'm excited. <laughs> don't you ever get tired? Come on, church. Don't you ever get tired of pushing people to worship? Yes. Pushing people to come to church? Come on. No. Pushing people to pray? No. Pushing people to study the word of God? We need to understand, church, that this could be the hour of the greatest visitation your family has ever known. Amen. You say, well, it didn't happen yesterday, last week, last month, last year, last decade. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, how often would I like to take him as a hymn brings under her wings. Mm -hmm. This is what I got for you. The prophet said there's food for everybody tomorrow. Yeah. The prophet said, come on, there's food tomorrow. Mm -hmm. He said, yesterday... 80 pieces of silver for donkey's head. Dove's dung. Tomorrow, he said, you can buy 40 pounds for 65 cents. Praise God. Praise God, church. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. 
Hallelujah. I get tired of religion. <laughs> I get tired of tradition. I get tired of the concepts of men. <clears throat> Satisfied and complacent at the gate is not good enough. Yes. <clears throat> church, I want to tell you tonight, the love that's in the heart for the church world. Satisfied and complacent at the gate is not good enough. I'd rather die inside the city than to die outside of the gate. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. I'd rather die a thousand deaths inside the city than sat here complacent and die. And I believe the Lord will like to stir us up. I'm trying. But I believe the Lord will like to stir us up. Get us to pray like we never prayed. Get us to praise like we've never praised. Get us to love the Word of God like we never loved it before. Pray for your pastor. When your, power, when your pastor preaches not very good, pray for him that he'd have a fresh word. Say, God, my pastor didn't make two cents. It made no sense when he preached on Sunday. That was the worst I ever heard him preach. Don't say that to me. I hurt my feelings. I'm just, just say it to God. <laughs> say the word was stale. There was no the word wasn't fresh. Hallelujah. We need fresh word. Come on, we need fresh wheat, church. We need fresh word. Come on, we need fresh praise. Fresh prayer. Fresh presence. No more donkey's head. I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray this every day. God, do not give me another stubborn person. <laughs> Jesus, hallelujah. Do not give me another stubborn religious person in this church. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? Yes, I apologize for that. That was my outside voice. <laughs> that, was my, that was my outside voice. Should have I, I, if I should have said that, I apologize. <laughs> you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. We want hungry people. Come on, church. Right. We yeah. want thirsty people. Right. We yeah. want people that want fresh wheat, fresh word, fresh yeah. wine, fresh yeah. presence. Yeah. Hallelujah. That wants to have everything that God has for them. In Jesus' oh, yeah. name. Yeah. Stand together with me right now, would you please? Just lift your hands to the Lord for a moment. Hallelujah. Would you just love him tonight, church, for a moment? Ask the Lord to give you that kind of desire. Would you do that in the name of Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. Stir me up, Jesus. Stir me up, Jesus. Hallelujah. God, we're not going to die outside of the gate. I won't allow this church to die outside of the gate. Hallelujah. Come on, saints. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ, I won't allow living way to die outside of the gate because God, I know. God, I know that you got fresh word. You got fresh presence. Oh, God, for us. Woo, stir us up. Stir us up in prayer. Stir us up in prayer. Hallelujah. 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 Take any stagnation from us, any stainless from us, God. In the name, in the name, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God, we've got absolutely nothing to lose. God, I've got nothing to lose, only but a chance. Hallelujah. 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 God, take donkeys head and dumb's dung and boil children from us, God. Give us your fresh presence, God. Fresh word. God, even this Sunday, God, as we come to the house of the Lord. Hallelujah, as these ladies gather tomorrow night, God. Hallelujah, for a time of fellowship and friendship and a feeding night. As the men come together Sunday morning, God, as we gather together Sunday morning, oh, hallelujah. Shabbat Oh, stir us, stir us, stir us up, oh, God. Help us to be hungry, help us to be thirsty, Lord, in the name of Jesus. In the name, in the name, in the name, in the name. Oh, come on, church, one more time. 
God, we want freshness. We want freshness. We want freshness. Hallelujah. I'm telling you tonight, church, He has things for your family, your children. Yes, He has. Yes, He has. He's got salvation for them. They're not here tonight. They're not here Sunday. He's got salvation for them. I say this to you tonight many times. I say it again tonight. Don't give up. Don't give up just yet. There's hope as long as God is alive. Hear me. I said there's hope as God. I'm trying to say it in English. There is hope as long as God is alive. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be blessed tonight. Fellowship together. Be friendly. Be nice. Be caring. Be loving. Now, if you want one of these books that assisted before you leave. Amen. In Jesus' name. Now, fellowship together. Be